In contemporary times, most socialists have shifted away from overtly dictatorial socialisms. And particularly among younger people, there is some level of awareness of socialism's terrible history, uh, particularly in the 20th century. But those who are attracted to socialism do still think of it as an ideal to be striven for. So their question for themselves typically is, how how do I keep the socialism? but bracket or overcome its its bad history. They will then typically say things like, well, the socialist ends were fine, but the means that the previous socialists used were not fine. Or they'll say things like, uh, socialism is good in theory, but unfortunately it didn't work out in practice. And one interesting, more general claim here is there are arguments for and against socialism given its historical track record parallel our arguments over the history of religion, if we note that detractors of religion will make a point of identifying you know, the terrible record of Christians attacking Jews and doing terrible things to each other, and of course Hindus against Sikhs and Buddhists versus Muslims and Muslims versus many other groups and, and so on. Or in European history alone, the Crusades and the persecutions of uh, scientists like Giordano Bruno and Galileo, the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, including the Inquisitions and so on. So there's a long, bloody, nasty history of religion. And we note then that historically religious people will then live through that and see the need for tolerance, so they will clean up their gen- their act and act more tolerantly and peacefully. But then a generation later, people forget the history or they don't see its relevance there. They're attracted to their religious faith, so they want to keep the faith and dial down the significance of uh, the violent history. And the way it seems to go is that uh, from their perspective, uh, often genuinely, they'll be saying things like, you know, I'm a nice person and I, I believe in my religion. I don't want to kill or torture or persecute anyone. And I don't really see why my beliefs would make me want to do that. Uh, or even make me do that. So I'm going to keep my religion. And the same thing, I think, happens for those who are attracted to socialism, right? Many younger socialists will say, hey, I'm a, I'm a nice person, and I, I believe in socialism. I'm attracted to it. And I know that lots of socialists in the past have done bad things, but I don't want to kill or torture anybody. And I don't see why, uh, you know, my wanting to redistribute some wealth or make everyone more equal socially is going to lead to that. So I'm going to keep my socialism and combine it with democracy, which seems nice too. But you'll notice it's the same argument over that dynamic, whether we're talking about religion or socialism. Does the logic of the belief, whether religious or socialist, drive toward the nasty manifestations that have appeared historically, or are the manifestations kind of accidental or a perversion or some sort of avoidable other possibility? So it is true that there are lots of leading socialists who have argued over the course of the last two centuries that socialism has to be politically authoritarian in all areas, that any sort of democratic socialism is uh, is a myth or some sort of a cover story, that it has to be something that comes about by violence, or even if it does come about by peaceful means, it must be maintained by forceful methods and a kind of compelled obedience. So on that score, I will refer you to uh, my, my podcast, Eight Socialists Define Socialism. Uh, Marx, Lenin, Mao are in the former group who argue quite forcefully that democratic socialism can't happen. Socialism has to be brought about by violent revolutionary methods. And uh, uh, Saint-Simon, Heilbrunner, and others are in the latter category. They'll argue however socialism comes about. Nonetheless, it can't be maintained by majority rule or, or democratic nice methods. It must be maintained by forceful and compelled obedience methods. But there are those who disagree, right? Those who believe socialism can be democratic, democratic rather. So let's, let's uh, consider their arguments and, and hear them out. Now, there are some uh, subtleties, distinctions, and complexities that uh, need to be addressed. Uh, Socialism means lots of things to different people, but I'm going to argue that the the most important distinction here with respect to democratic socialism is that socialism is not necessarily only a politics. Socialism can be an ethos 
and socialism can be a politics. One can, in one's ethics, communally collectivize, prioritize the social over the individual, and absent any sort of political enforcement, believe that as a moral ideal, strictly, right, one should see oneself not primarily as an individual, but rather as a servant of the group or as belonging to the group, and that the group's values and priorities should be given a front front row social seat uh, compared to one owns, one's own rather pursuit of uh, individual happiness or, or whatever. But there is also, of course, a political socialism, which then you say uh, for society as a whole, we use the power of government or we use the power of the state to make everyone follow the, the socialist route. And democratic socialism and the attraction of democratic socialism will be a little bit different depending on whether, for you, socialism is primarily an ethos or a, a politics. So let's take up the ethos first and consider various kinds of non-political uh, and voluntary socialism. So, for example... Whatever kind of society one is living in more broadly, and obviously this is easier in, in liberal societies that give people a lot of freedom, one is uh, perfectly free to start a commune. You can be a hippie and, and, and say, I'm not going to buy into corporate materialist culture or whatever. I'm going to uh, join up with a number of other people who share my back to nature or more communal lifestyle. And uh, one of us happens to own a farm and we're just going to go and live on the farm and live communally according to a small s non-political socialist ethos. There are lots of religious uh, communes, for example, the Hutterites or the long history of monasteries and con convents that are, that are formed, or kibbutzes, in, uh, Jewish kibbutzes in the state of Israel. And so in those cases, you have people who voluntarily commit to a socialist, communal, collectivized ethos. They're going to do everything together uh, for the good of the group, and they're going to subordinate their individuality to, to the group. Now, almost all of these groups will uh, uh, have voluntary entry into the commune. Usually, they will have substantial participatory uh, procedures, lots of discussion and voting about uh, what the rules are going to be and who's going to do what and who's going to get what. And they will also have uh, the option of exit. If you uh, don't like the idea of the commune any longer, then you are free to leave. And so in the United States and Canada, for example, uh, where I'm most uh, familiar with, there are lots of such communities that have been formed over the over the histories of those countries. Now, it's a little more complicated because those communes are nested within a broader liberal individualist framework that protects their property rights and it provides them some military protections and other things, and that complicates the analysis. But let's set that aside and just focus on the internal social structure. It's communal and it's voluntary, and it's a, it's a socialist ethos that is being put into, into practice in these organizations. So that then is to say, if you are a critic of socialism, it's not only the compulsion that one has to focus on. Socialism can be non-compulsory. Instead, it's the ethos of communalism that's primary. And then the question is going to be really an ethics debate. Is such collectivism or communalism a moral ideal? Or, by contrast, is morality about individual dream-seeking and self-responsibility? Are you first an individual with your own life to live? Or really, morally, should you see yourself first and foremost as part of a group that, uh, that you know, and its values are going to define you and assign you responsibilities and so forth? But if it is not simply a personal, ethical, or voluntarily, uh, a voluntary, rather, social commitment that you want, you actually want a socialist politics, then what is that? Well, we always have to remember politics is about the role of government, and government is an institution of compulsion. And so the moral question for politics then always is, under what circumstances can we should uh, use compulsion, right? Who has the authority to use compulsion or physical force and under what circumstances? And it's precisely at this point then that the adjective labels like democratic or aristocratic or monarchic, etc., those become important because those are labels that are political labels defining who gets to use force and under what circumstances. So, 
When we then turn to democratic socialism, we're talking about socialism in an overtly political context about the use of physical compulsion, compulsion rather, for all members of society. And then, uh, you know, here we can ask a question. There's lots of variations of socialism politically, and there's a long history of uh, socialists arguing among themselves whether socialism should be monarchical, right, whether it should be aristocratic, or whether it should be democratic. So who should have the power over you as an individual? Uh, is it one person who uh, ultimately speaks for society as a whole, uh, or should it be an elite group, or should it be the majority? And so some uh, versions of uh, socialism are more monarchical, some are more elitist, and some are major, more majoritarian or, or democratic. Now, there have been some very prominent elitist versions, uh, lots of paternalist socialists who think that most people, they need to be controlled and directed you know, for their own good, so they will think of themselves benevolently as, as, as paternalists eternally exercising power over all of society. There are Fabian socialists who think that really, you know, most people don't have what it takes to run a society as a whole. Rather, there's an elite group of individuals who have the intelligence and the character to run society on behalf of the collective. So they are more aristocratic forms of socialism. And of course, there are those who recognize that uh, elitist socialists or aristocratic forms of socialism have uh, typically evolved or devolved into monarchical socialism. You know, one person in the elite group eventually assumes control, and uh, perhaps they are fine with that. But of course, those elitist and monarchical forms of socialism typically rub those attracted to democratic socialism the wrong way. Uh, democratic approaches sound nicer, uh, more benevolent to, to such individuals. And so they will argue that they want the socialism, but they want to combine it with democratic political institutions. And this uh, does mean, though, that most democratic socialists are at least initially partly individualistic. They, they do say, you know, every individual's voice should count in society, should count for something. And we do think that every individual should have a vote, have some say in, in the process. So that then is to say, democratic socialists typically are not coming in with a strongly robust commitment to collectivism or communalism in all forms. They want to have some individualistic elements, and that comes out in their uh, advocacy of democratic participatory institutions. But here's the problem, and uh, this is the first criticism I would, would make of democratic socialism, and to say, look, obviously in monarchies and in dictatorships, right, you have one person in charge, and that one person is telling you what to do. Well, what's your objection to that? Well, your objection to that then is to say, well, you know, why is that person, that one person, telling me what to do with my life? What gives him or her the, the authority to use power over me? That seems wrong. But under democratic socialism, all you have done is switch to the majority of people telling you what to do. So instead of your life being at the disposal of one person who claims to be speaking for society as a whole, it's at the disposal of the majority of people who claim to be speaking for society as a whole. And the only thing wrong with the dictatorship then, according to this kind of socialism, is that too few people are in on the decision-making process. So they might say, you know, saying, well, you know, if there's just one person who's a dictator and he wants to tax you at 75%, well, that's unjust, right? But if the majority of people decide to tax you at 75%, that's okay because it's democratic. But there's not really a significant moral difference here. In both cases, it's other people who are compelling you to the tune of 75% of your productivity right, belongs to him or belongs to, to them. So this is a, a tangent to be pursued at greater length, but there's a very interesting piece published by Robert Nozick back in the 1970s called The Tale of the Slave that walks one through in a very uh, interesting step-by-step thought experiment. So, you know, Nozick asks you to start off by imagining uh, just the worst case of slavery that you possibly can imagine. I'll put a, a, a link to this in the in the notes or transcript when we publish it. But he imagines you to ask, you know, that you are living as a as a slave and your your master is very brutal 
and making you do you know hard work and confiscating all of your your labor and so forth. So clearly that's slavery and that's that's immoral and unjust. But then he softens it a little bit and he says, well, you know, suppose that you know your your master is a nice master. You know, he makes you work hard, but not really hard. He doesn't actually whip you, and maybe he gives you a half a day off on, on a fairly regular basis so you can spend some time on your own. And, okay, are you still a slave? Well, yes, obviously, right, you're still a slave. And then Nozick changes the scenario to say, well, suppose your master uh, says, you know, I'm going to actually let you leave the plantation once in a while, and you can go off into the city and get a job if you like. But I'm just going to require that you send back all of your wages to me. And in the evenings, you have to come and sleep on the plantation. So I'm giving you the freedom to go off into the city and so forth. Well, are you still a slave? And you know, well, yes, obviously you are. You are a slave. Well, then suppose the master says, you know, I'm only going to ask you to send back 50% of your wages when you're off working in the city and you can get any kind of job that you want. And uh, I'm not going to require that you sleep here on the plantation. You know, I'll, I'll give you a housing allowance. You can get yourself an apartment in the city while you're working there, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, are you uh, still a slave? And you'd say, yeah, obviously you're still a slave. Now, suppose we then save it. Suppose uh, the master then says, you know, I've got a, I've got a big family and I'm going to let them in on the decision-making process. So, you know, all 20 of my cousins and brothers and sisters and so forth and parents, we're going to vote on what to, whether, you know, your, the, the wages that you send back should be 50% or 45% and so on, etc. And so we're introducing some democratic and we're broadening the franchise a little bit. Are you a slave? And, you know, Nozick points out, yeah, obviously you're still a slave. And so the point then is going to be as we continue to broaden the franchise. Maybe Nozick would then say, you know, there's all these other slaves who are working on the plantation, and they're also out working in society, some of them, and they're sending back their wages. Suppose I let them start to have a vote and a say on who's doing what jobs and whether, you know, uh, you know, the, the amount that you're sending back to me, the slave owner, is 55% or 52% or whatever. I'm going to give you guys more of a say in on this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Are you still a slave? And the point is, yes, you're still a slave, right? And suppose he then say, well, suppose we're going to let you also uh, participate in the discussions and have a vote on whether your tax rate is going to be 51% or 60% or whatever. Are you still a slave if we give you one vote and now your vote is one person out of 10,000? Are you still a slave? And so on. So the point of the thought experiment is to highlight the principle. If other people are making decisions over your life, what you can and can't do and what your product of your labor is going to be and who gets the disposal of that, you are still a slave. And it doesn't really make a difference if it's one person who's calling the shots or whether it's 20 people who are calling the shots or if your vote is one out of 10,000 or one in a million people calling the shots. You're a slave to the extent that you are not calling the shots with respect to your own life. So the democratic issue is being highlighted, I think, very nicely by that thought experiment. But let me turn now to a second and related criticism. A second criticism is that socialism is not only about money. Uh, often uh, socialists and democratic socialists are focusing on money and redistributing wealth. But money and wealth are not the only values in society. Right? So, for example, you know, one person, you know, the monarch, wants to restrict what movies you can watch or what books you can read. Well, you'll say, hey, that's a dictatorial imposition on my, on my right to choose for myself here. But uh, it would make no moral difference if it's 51% of the population that wants to restrict or otherwise forbid certain movie and book choices that you want to make. So we can ask, you know, if we're going to be democratic, right, what should we be democratic about, right? What kinds of things should be voted on? You know, if uh, our socialist commitment is to say, well, you know, social values take precedence over individual values and we should be voting on all social values, then what about all of the other values that are important socially, such as sexuality and reproduction and religion and racial issues and art and so forth. You know, for example, uh, should we vote on who can have sex with your girlfriend tonight? Uh, I mean, can you or your girlfriend say no if the majority wants to you know, redistribute her sexual favors? You know, 
What's the difference between redistributing your sexuality and redistributing your money? Or for example, religion has very important social implications. Should we vote on what religious services you can participate in and uh, what kind of religions uh, should be allowed? Should we vote uh, in the workplace about whether to hire brown people or only people of this race as opposed to, to that? Should we vote about how many women can go to university? Should it be a, a matter of democracy and what's best for society to raise the question, well, is society served better by women bearing more children or becoming better educated? Let's vote on it. Or should we properly be saying, no, that's an individual choice that each woman should make for herself. In the case of art, you know, how many artists do we actually need in society? How should we allocate society's artistic values and all of the resources that are needed to create music and sculpture and paintings, right, and, and so forth? Well, let's, let's vote on that. After all, art is uh, also a social value that is, that is very important. Now, we can try to say, hey, no, 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 this is only about money, but uh, why is money special? You know, money is just one value. And if we're going to collectivize money on the grounds that it's socially important, then we are going to end up social collectivizing rather everything because you can make an argument for just about anything being socially valuable. Now, the third criticism that I, I want to make uh, and raise is that whether uh, democratic socialists want to or not intentionally, democratic socialism does become dictatorial socialism and dictatorial socialism does lead to brutal individuals assuming power over society. And it happens both by unintentional routes, unintended consequences apply here, and intended routes. The concentration of power in the hands of the, of the state or a government, uh, whoever speaks for society as a whole, that power uh, is very attractive to individuals who want power, and uh, sooner or later they will acquire that power. There's no checks and balances that ever any socialist has ever developed theoretically or practically to uh, guard against that danger. And the point is uh, going to be, we start first with the unintended slide toward totalitarian or dictatorial socialism, that uh, if you start from the premise that society takes precedence over the individual, and you add to the fact that everything is connected causally, then everything about the individual is going to be controlled by society and controlled by the majority. So action, speech, thought, and consequences, all of them are causally connected. There's no way you can, in principle, isolate any aspect of an individual once you started from the premise that the, society, the social takes precedence over the individual. So, for example, suppose you say, well, no, no, I just want to control money and the distribution of money. Well, where does money come from? Well, money comes from certain actions. So, democratically, you're going to vote to control the actions in order to control the production of money. But actions also follow from thoughts, and thoughts follow from, uh, in, involve uh, embodiment in speech. So if you're going to control people's actions, you're going to want to control speech, you're going to want to control thoughts, and so forth. So what individuals think, what they can say, what actions they're allowed to do, uh, particularly anything that impinges on productivity that leads to money that's got to be redistributed socially by the logic of the argument you need to control all of it democratically. And that then means that everything an individual can say or think or do is going to be in principle subject to social control. And over time, it will be controlled by the majority. And we can see this then, uh, and this is a variation on this, in the experience of the minority groups in, in a society. And this will be a variant criticism here. Democracy means majority rule. It's very rare that you can get 100% consensus on any issue. So the best that you can do is say, well, it's got to be a majority. Sometimes uh, you might say it needs to be a super majority, but who is going to be the majority in these cases? It's always going to be coalitions and blocks, and those are going to be shifting coalitions and shifting blocks along many social dimensions. Uh, there'll be economic majorities, religious majorities, ideological, racial, sex, gender majorities, ethnic background majorities, and so on. 
And what does this imply then for those who are consistently in the minority? Right? Well, those, that then means that the minority has to do what the majority says, even if the majority's interests are contrary to the interests of the minority. So Connor Friedersdorf, in a nice article in The Atlantic, for example, I'll give the reference here in 2018, uh, made a very good point about the logic of socialism, how it will lead to larger groups dominating minority groups. Yeah, democratic socialism is not a friend for to uh, rather to uh, to those groups or and individuals who are members of groups uh, consistently in minority groups, and this is a special application of Alexis de Tocqueville's more general point from uh, Democracy in America, in the, published in the 1830s, about how the tyranny of the majority can be just as ruthless as the tyranny of any minority as possible. So, majoritarian tyranny is uh, not really any better than elitist or monarchical tyranny. And uh, it's also important to note, if you really are interested in minorities, uh, Ayn Rand's spot-on point that, quote, the smallest minority on earth is the individual, and those who are denying individual rights cannot claim to be defenders of minorities. So the general criticism here is that democracy has its place, but it really must be subordinated to a uh, respect for the individual and for individual human beings and their rights. So there is a natural, logical evolution to the majority assuming more and more control over all aspects of human life and for majorities to assume increasing control over minorities and individuals all the way down. The logic leads even nice majoritarian democratic socialists to become dictatorial over all aspects of life. There's no principled stopping point. But of course, the short term, more da greater danger is uh, that that uh, that concentration of power that goes with socialism. If you're not leaving individuals free to make their own choices and to make their own voluntary social groups and to, to to associate and dissociate as they judge fit, instead the power of society needs to be institutionalized, and that means institutionalized in a government, which is some subset of the population that had, had then has a lot of police and military and other forms of compulsory power. That kind of power is attractive to lots and lots of individuals in society. So if we vote to concentrate powers, right, individuals and groups in the majority, they have to do what the majority says. So the majority form a government with lots of power over everybody else. Who is going to use that power? Well, you know, in, in, in uh, any given generation, there's going to be two kinds of people. Now, there's going to be the benevolent, nicer socialist type who says, no, 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 I want to uh, be in the government, but I want to use that power, and I'm a nice person on behalf of what I think is good for society as a whole. But there are going to be predatory types uh, who will say, uh, and they will know how to uh, get involved in the political process, and they want to use that concentrated power for their own benefit to advance their own interests at the expense. Now, if you have the more ruthless predatory type who wants to use that concentrated power, and they're competing with the nice, benevolent, democratic socialist type who also wants to use that power, when it comes down to actual democratic politics, which side is going to prevail in that process? Well, it's not going to be the nice guys. Concentrated political power, when the stakes are high, it's going to be the more ruthless, the more willing to stab people in the back, the more uh, efficient at using the process to acquire power over others. Those are the ones who are going to prevail, and they will marginalize those who uh, have nice intentions by their own lights. So, and this is, of course, what the experience of socialism has shown over and over again. The nice guys do get shunted out, and it is the, the predatory types who grab power. So I want to uh, end with a, a gut check, as I think of it, for socialists and those who are attracted to democratic socialism. The first is, you know, if you really are a fan of democratic socialism, there's nothing that's stopping you from going ahead and forming your own socialist commune. If you are finding yourself attracted to the political route, why are you going the political route and demanding that all others in society conform to your idea of a socialist society? And the only answer can be, well, because building your own 
working commune and making it go successfully and voluntarily convincing other people to join with your socialist commune, that is a lot of work. And politics offers you a shortcut. By political socialism, what you can do is you can take over all of the existing assets that are out there in society. And you can force socialism on the minority of people who didn't want it or didn't vote for it. Politics is a shortcut. And you should be aware that you are taking that shortcut. So if it feels right, then democratic socialism is not really about being democratic. It's about having political power to confiscate and to enforce conformity on those who don't want to voluntarily contribute their economic resources and do things rather the way that you want them to do it. I also will offer this uh, gut check against uh, those who are tempted to ignore the brutal history of socialism and uh, to point out that the terrible authoritarian history of socialism is at the same time the democratic history of socialism. I mean, there are those who have said, no, 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 we are democratic socialists all the way through. And there are those who are forthrightly authoritarian socialists all the way through. But those two lines are historically blurred. And democratic socialism has very quickly shaded into authoritarian socialism. So I'll give you three examples. The Italian fascists, uh, led by Mussolini, who was a very good card-carrying socialist up until World War I, the Italian fascists came to power democratically in 1922, and they became authoritarian under Mussolini within three years. And the Italian fascists explicitly thought of themselves as socialists, but socialists with nationalistic aspirations. It was socialism for the Italian people. The National Socialists, not very much longer. Remember that they also came to power through democratic and constitutional means in Weimar, Germany. And so they were voted into power and appointed by constitutional methods. But within a year, the, the, uh, that democratic route to socialism led to Adolf Hitler and his cohort transforming Germany very quickly into a dictatorship. Let's also not forget, and this is my third example, that the international socialists, that is to say the communists in Russia, they were uh, organizing the whole country into local democratic councils, right? They called them Soviets. And each of those little democratic councils had a great deal of autonomy and control over their local area. And they would send representatives up the hierarchy to regional Soviets and national councils or national Soviets. And that was uh, partly sincere in intention, but it was also very easily subverted by more ruthless dictatorial so socialists like Joseph Stalin. So the line between uh, dictatorial socialism and uh, democratic socialism historically is not at all clear. The one has blended into and given rise very easily to the other. And contemporary uh, uh, democratic socialists uh, uh, need to say explicitly, I recognize that that has happened repeatedly in history. And if you have a solution for how to avoid that, that needs to be announced, discussed before you start uh, in practice assuming awesome political power and concentrating that power. And one more uh, slight tangent, uh, but it's still historically relevant. I'm making uh, notes for this podcast early in 2020, which is an election year in the United States. And as we're looking at the array of candidates, one question that's uh, on a lot of people's lips is, uh, will the United States get its first democratic socialist president this year? And I should point out that we've already had one uh, a century ago, and that is Woodrow Wilson, who was uh, president in the early part of the 20th century. So I want to quote directly from Woodrow Wilson from an article he wrote called Socialism and Democracy, published while he was still a professor, uh, but uh, announcing his, uh, his political philosophy. And he argued, quote, I'll put again this quotation in, uh, in the notes, quote, Socialism and democracy are almost, if not quite, one and the same. They both rest at bottom upon the absolute right of the community to determine its own destiny and that of its members. Men as communities are supreme over men as individuals. Limits of wisdom and convenience to the public control there may be. Limits of principle there are upon strict analysis 
none. Unquote. Now, that's our first Democratic Socialist President Woodrow Wilson saying, in principle, there are no limits upon the individual. Socialism, including democratic socialism, means total control over the individual. So I want to uh, conclude with some uh, points in resistance uh, and urge uh, you to, in thought and in action, resist the democratic socialist call. It can be a wolf in sheep's clothing, but it can also be a lot of sheep who end up ganging up on smaller uh, individual sheep who, uh, and I don't know how far I want to extend this metaphor, who want to do their own thing. Wildrow Wilson is correct. Socialism knows no limits over the individual. Sometimes we think of democracy as a political check, but democratic and overtly dictatorial socialism do end up in the same place. And so the response to uh, calls for democratic socialism have to be the same as the response to the overtly dictatorial forms of socialism. The individual is sacrosanct. You, as an individual, you have the moral right to live for yourself. No one, any individual, any elite uh, self-described group or any majority has the right to control your life and to take your product. Life is individual. We need to think for ourselves, we need to form values, make plans for our own lives, and take responsibility and do it. Your life matters. No group, elected or not, has moral priority over you. And also I want to say, in my view, that the strongest attraction of socialism is not an idealism, but rather that socialism is an appeal to one's weaknesses, uh, to many people's weaknesses. You know, a fear that many people have of having to make it on your own. And so there's a wanting to be looked after, and socialism says it will look after you, the group will look after you, the majority of people will look after you. So you don't have to follow through and assume that deep individual responsibility all of the way down. But recognize that's a weakness and that socialism's appeal is, uh, is, is, is pushing on that button. And the other appeal, I think, is another form of weakness, but that, and that's a weakness of respect, that you do not respect your fellow human beings enough to think that they can make it on their own. And so you want some sort of a guarantee that someone's going to look after them. Right? The majority will look after the minority, or everybody will look after everyone. And socialism comes along and says, we will guarantee that everyone is looked after. And again, that is a disrespect to other people. Uh, if you're saying that fundamentally you're thinking of other people as needing to be looked after. Now those two, you know, the fear for yourself and the strong independence and that lack of respect for other people, I think they also can combine and lead you to blind yourself to the fact that there are lots of just plain power lusters out there who simply want to control others and who use socialism as an apparent moral veneer for their dictatorial ambitions. So the anti debts to socialism, I think in the final analysis, are moral, not political. They're moral. They're pride and they are self-respect. Pride in your own competence and respect for other people's ability to run their own lives. Proud people know that they can decide their own life adventures and they want to stand or fall by their own choices. Respectful people, they don't see their fellow human beings as charity cases needing direction and handouts. And so I think both of them resist socialism's, we will take care of you. Right, as an insult to human dignity. So just to, to conclude, right, democratic socialism, right, it is a politic, but I think that underlying that there is a socialist ethos that's based on an attraction based in human weakness, and that's what needs to be fought. It's the ethics, uh, not the politics that's fundamental. So concentrate your philosophical attentions there. <laughs>